Hello and welcome back to Lady Disdain Reads. My name is Beatrice and today I'm going to be discussing the idea of repentance in Jane Austen's novels. Now, what was my starting point when I decided to make this video? Well, many of you might have heard of C.S. Lewis. Some of you might know him for his fiction, especially his children's book series, The Chronicles of Narnia. Some of you might know him for his works on Christian apologetics, such as his very famous book, Mere Christianity. But did you know that in the 1950s he wrote an essay on Jane Austen? Well, that is exactly the essay that I'm going to be discussing today to talk about the idea of repentance. If you're new to my channel, I suggest you watch some of my other videos, especially the ones on ethics in Jane Austen and uh, duty in Jane Austen. Either before you watch this video or afterwards. This will help you to understand some of the ideas that I'm talking about and to make more sense of some of the ideas that maybe I am taking for granted as I discuss them. I will link both of those videos down below, so do check them out. Now let's get straight into the discussion for today. C.S. Lewis, in his essay A Note on Jane Austen, begins by quoting four quite lengthy passages from four major Jane Austen novels, so four of her novels out of the six major novels. I selected specific passages from these longer extracts that C.S. Lewis chose and I'm going to read them out to you because I really want to illustrate how cleverly he picked out those passages. Feel free to pause this video at any point to read at your leisure um, and as you listen to me reading these passages Try to see if you can spot any idea or theme that links all of them. Try to see if you can guess what C.S. Lewis is trying to get at. So let's start. Northanger Abbey, after Henry Tilney reproaches Catherine Morland for thinking that his father might have murdered Henry's mother, the narrator tells us this of Catherine. Her mind made up on these several points and her resolution formed of always judging and acting in future with the greatest good sense. She had nothing to do but forgive herself and be happier than ever. Let's move on to the next major novel. In Sense and Sensibility, once Marion Dashwood recovers both from her physical illness and from the illness of her infatuation with Mr. Willoughby, she confesses this to her sister, Eleanor. My illness I well knew had been entirely brought on by myself, by such negligence of my own health as I felt even at the time to be wrong. Had I died, it would have been self-destruction. I wonder that the very eagerness of my desire to live, to have time for atonement to my God and to you all, did not kill me at once. Let's move on to the next passage. Now we get to Pride and Prejudice. And this is a passage when Elizabeth Bennet discovers the truth of Mr. Wickham's character from Mr. Darcy's letter. And she thinks this to herself. How humiliating is this discovery? Yet, how just a humiliation. Had I been in love, I could not have been more blind. But vanity, not love, has been my folly. I have courted prepossession at ignorance and driven reason away. Till this moment, I never knew myself. Finally, we have Emma. Once the eponymous heroine, Emma Woodhouse, realises her folly, both in trying to control Harriet Smith's love life and also, once she discovers that Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax are engaged, and she had no idea of this, she is shocked at her own lack of understanding of other people and of what's going on around her. And she says this. How to understand it all? How to understand the deceptions she had been thus practising on herself and living under? The blunders the blindness of her own heart and head. Now, these are the four passages. Do you think you've spotted a common theme in all of them? Lewis argues that the common theme is this. All four heroines, so we've got Catherine, we have Marianne, Elizabeth and Emma, 
go through a process of what he calls undeception, whereby this is what happens to them. They discover that they have been making mistakes, both about themselves and about the world in which they live. All the information these heroines have so far collected has to be re-evaluated in light of the discovery that they had been, up to this point, gravely mistaken about one, if not more, aspects of their lives. This idea of the importance of blunders or blundering Note that Emma uses that word in the passage I read to you. Um, is not this, this idea of the importance of blunders is not unique to C.S. Lewis when talking about Jane Austen. To give you an example, um, literary critic and Professor John Mullen has an entire chapter on the significance of the word blunder in Emma in his book What Matters in Jane Austen, which is a very good book, by the way. However, Lewis does a particularly good job at identifying the underlying Christian significance of this process of undeception. This is what is slightly more unique to him. For instance, Lewis points out the fact that Marianne's language is markedly religious, and it includes words such as atonement, God, and self-destruction, all of which have theological significance. He even counters the potential criticism that he is taking Austen's novels too seriously, that they are in fact light-hearted comedies and nothing more than that, by arguing this. The hard core of morality, and even of religion, seems to me to be just what makes good comedy possible. Principles or seriousness are essential to Jane Austen's art. Where there is no norm, nothing can be ridiculous. Lewis here, really shrewdly observes that Austen's comedies are successful precisely because she presents specific moral norms. We laugh at the follies of her characters and rejoice when the heroines learn the error of their ways. So comedy and moral norms go together for Lewis, and I think that's a really good point. Finally, Lewis offered us an explanation as to why Mansfield Park and Persuasion are not included. Both novels, he argues, follow heroines that don't make significant moral blunders, and therefore heroines that cannot have a great moment of undeception. I would argue that Anne Elliot, in Persuasion, does experience a kind of undeception when she allows herself to realise that she still loves Captain Wentworth. However, I do think that Lewis is right about Mansfield Park. Fanny Price like Anne Elliot, is a solitary heroine, but what sets them apart is that while Anne has regrets, while she does change her mind, at least about Captain Wentworth, Fanny Price is a heroine who witnesses other people's mistakes and deceptions without ever making a grave mistake herself and without ever really being deceived by others. She might be tempted, she might even think about it, she might be tempted by, by Henry Crawford, for example, but she never quite commits a mistake in the same way that Anne does in Persuasion. So as you can see, there is a lot about what Lewis has to say that I really agree with and that I really like. So what do I want to add to this today? Well, I told you I was going to discuss repentance, and Lewis never actually uses the word in his essay, so if you notice, I haven't really talked about repentance so far. I've sort of skirted around it. I want to propose this. I want to propose that what he terms undeception is actually best described as repentance. Let me compare two Greek terms to show why I think this is the case. The Greek term anagnorisis. Again, as I've said before in videos, if any of you are classicists, please forgive my pronunciation of Greek words. The term anagnorisis can be defined as the moment in a story when the protagonist realises something crucial that they didn't know before, changing their outlook on their entire life. They are, so to speak, undeceived about something that has been going on. So this sounds very similar to Lewis's use of the word undeception. However, I think that is only the first half of what happens to Jane Austen's heroines. 
The first step for an Austin heroine is to realise that they have failed, or rather that she has failed, in self-knowledge. And this would be the undeception part. But the second and equally important step is for her to feel the error of her ways and to repent for her actions. It is not just that Austin heroines realise that there's new information and that this new information changes their view of the people around them. It's important for them to realise what they have been mistaken about, how they have hurt others or themselves, to feel this and then to decide to resolve not to do this again in the future. Catherine, Mary, Anne, Elizabeth and Emma all deeply feel the damage they have caused both, both to others and to themselves. They reproach themselves, they admit their feelings, and crucially, they repent. This is closer to another Greek term, the word metanoia, which means something like a change of heart, or indeed can be translated as repentance. It's important to recognise this deception as actually a change of heart, not just the realisation of new information, because that allows us to see that Austen is leading her heroines through a moral and sentimental education, and that by doing so, she is potentially encouraging her readers to be alert to the necessity of such a moral education in their own lives. Now, I really hope you enjoyed this video. Today's video is a little bit shorter, um, but do keep an eye out next week, um, or the week after that, for the review of Irene Collins' book, Jane Austen, the Parson's Daughter. I promised this to you for this week, but um, there's been a change of schedule, so that's coming soon. And if everything goes to plan, either next week or the next, um, after that, at some point in between this video and the Irene Collins video, we're going to be talking about comedy and satire again, but this time we're going to use Pride and Prejudice to focus on those ideas. So I really hope you enjoy this video, and until the next video on Pride and Prejudice, hopefully, um, do check out some of the, my other videos in the description below, and have a good week, and see you then. Bye!